Hi. <laughs> so Naomi Hirahara is the Edgar Award winning author of two mystery series set in Southern California. Um, and she's a former editor of the Rafu Shimpo newspaper and has published short noir stories, middle grade fiction and nonfiction history books. And she currently resides in Pasadena, California and has been a longtime supporter and friend of Janum. Um, and we're really excited to have today as well, Kathleen Birkinshaw, who is a Japanese American author and daughter of Hiroshima survivor residing in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, she's presented at the UN, um, NYC, and teacher conferences in middle high schools for the past nine years with her book, The Last Cherry Blossom, which is the United Nations Office for Disarmament Affairs resource for teachers and students. Um, and with that, I'm going to welcome them both in and pass the mic over to you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Joy, for that lovely introduction. Um, and thank you all for being here today. I'm really excited to be part of the Japanese American National Museum, a virtual event. And I'm also very happy to be able to finally do something with uh, someone I consider a very good friend, a Hibaksha sister, Naomi. So I'm glad that we get to do this together. Uh, I thought what I would do is just start to talk a little bit about how The Last Cherry Blossom came to be, and that's going to kind of play into the perspective that I had as a second generation Hibaksha. Um, it was about 10 years ago. My daughter was in seventh grade, and she came home from school very upset. She said, we just finished studying World War II, and I overheard some kids talking about that cool mushroom cloud picture. Can you tell the students in my class about the, um, oh, sorry, can you tell the students in our class about what happened under those clouds, like with grandma? And so that led me to calling up my mom and asking her if it was possible to talk about it. Now, I never spoke about it publicly before. Uh, actually, I didn't even know she was from Hiroshima until I was 11. She told everyone that she was from Tokyo. And that really started, I think, because when she moved to Tokyo with a relative that she had met for the first time at the, uh, about a year after the atomic bombing, when she went there, if she said she was from Hiroshima, she noticed that people actually took a physical step backwards away from her, almost as if radiation would come off of her like sweat. Uh, so she learned to just start saying that she was from Tokyo then. Now, she met my dad in 1958. He was a, uh, an American serviceman in the Air Force, and he was stationed near Tokyo. And they married in 1959 at the U.S. Embassy in Tokyo. And then he was done with serving his time in the service, so he was going back home to the States. And they settled in Rhode Island, which is uh, where my, uh, husband, my father's family lived. Now, when my mom came, it was 14 years later, and she really didn't think there would be as much prejudice as she encountered when she moved here. Um, she didn't expect some of the racial slurs that she got. She felt that, you know, she was on the losing side um, and with everything else that she lost. So she decided she wouldn't tell them about Hiroshima because that would just put more of a spotlight on her. So she wanted to try to, I guess, blend as best she could by saying Tokyo. Uh, it, it was really tough for her because also with her name, her name was Toshiko, and um, some family members said that, uh, and some other people would say it was too difficult to pronounce, so they wanted to give her an American name, and they called her Betty. And I remember growing up also thinking her name was Betty or Elizabeth because that's how male ended up coming to the house. And when I asked my mom about it a little bit later, and she said, you know, well, they chose the name Betty, and all I could think of was the Flintstones. I mean, I, it, just, it just didn't make sense to me of why she had to also give up what she was used to calling herself. So when I was 11 years old, my mother had these horrible dreams a lot. She had a lot of nightmares, but August seemed to be when they would really be at their worst. She would have a lot more of them. Um, she'd wake up uh, screaming to them. And that summer, I happened to remember that the year before, it was around the same time that my mother had those awful nightmares again. So I pestered her quite a bit, and she finally did tell me that she was actually born in Hiroshima, but she lost her family, uh, her friends, and her home on August 6th, the atomic bombing. Uh, she said, I still can't really talk about it. It's still too painful, and don't tell anyone. So nothing was really discussed then. And in my childhood growing up, um, my mom wanted to make the home Americanized. That's what she called it. Uh, when she came to the States, within five years, 
she became a citizen of the United States. She also tried to um, learn English so she'd be able to converse much better. And so in the house, we didn't really have much of the Japanese culture. Um, we, uh, my mom would sing Japanese songs to me when I was little and she would tell me Japanese folk tales, but she would say them in English. Um, and she didn't teach me any Japanese. The only time I would see Japanese written would be when she was writing to the woman that I knew as my grandmother, uh, who was living in Tokyo. So it was um, not something then that I really got to focus on. And when I got into high school, that was the first time that I had some kind of an inkling of what maybe she went through when we read the book Hiroshima by John Hersey. And I remember I was in my room reading it and I got to one of the parts of it and I was just crying. And I remember coming out into the, the kitchen and saying to my mom, is this what happened? And she wouldn't even look at the book and she didn't even want me to say what I was at, going to ask her if she saw anything like it. She just said to me, it was hell. And she said, I, I can't talk about it. And please don't tell your teacher that I was there because I definitely can't talk about it. So. I really wonder if my mom would have ever told me what actually happened uh, if I hadn't gotten very sick when I was 30. I had been very ill and um, I ended up in the hospital for over a month and then I was kind of back and forth um, for a couple of years. But when I first got out of the hospital after that month, I couldn't take care of myself very well. I couldn't walk on my own. Uh, my daughter was four then, so I needed some help with her while my husband worked during the day. And my parents came. And my mom would talk to me and I could hear her telling Sarah stories of when um, my mom was younger and what she did, uh, but she never used Hiroshima. She always said Tokyo. And then I got the diagnosis of reflex sympathetic dystrophy. And what that is, it's a uh, neurological progressive chronic pain uh, syndrome. And it affects your sympathetic nervous system as well as it affects your immune system. And the physicians that I first saw, the neurologist, they had said that um, my weakened immune system, I had always had issues with that um, because my mother was in, exposed to radiation, and that was the effect that was on me. And it opened me up to this particular syndrome. Now, I learned about it and I was in a lot of pain. I also knew that um, I would probably be, end up in a wheelchair at some point and that it could spread through um, other parts of my body. And I had to give up a career that I worked really hard for. And then I also worried I had a four-year-old, how was I going to take care of her? Um, and I got very, very depressed and in despair. And my mom started to slowly share her memories of August 6th then. And she said to me, I'm sharing this with you because a year after the bombing, I was on a bridge and I was going to jump in and kill myself because everyone I loved was gone. But she said, you know, I, I could just hear my papa's voice in the way he used to talk about um, the stories of our samurai ancestors when I was younger and the way he would talk about uh, honor in the family and pride. And she thought, I want to make him proud. So she said, I didn't jump off that bridge. And I'm so glad because she said, I would have never had you and I would have never had your daughter. And so she wanted me to know that, um, that I had the strength and the same blood that was running through me of her samurai ancestors and that I would find the strength and I would be able to find my own way with that. So um, we fast forward now to where my daughter was in seventh grade, and I really thought my mom was going to say no, but she really surprised me, and she said yes. Now, I know part of it is because my daughter Sarah asked, and she was the only grandchild, so whatever she would ask, probably my mom would have done, but she said, you know, all the students are going to be the same age I was, or around it. My mom was 12 when the bomb dropped, and she felt... You know, maybe then they'll relate to what I was going through at that time. Um, they might be able to see it a little bit better through my eyes that way. And more importantly, she felt they're all going to be voters someday. And so they can leave that classroom knowing that nuclear weapons should never be used again. And so I went and I spoke to my daughter's class. And then the following year, I was invited to speak to the new seventh graders and other schools in the Charlotte area. And then some teachers started to ask if there might be any kind of a book that they could then use with their curriculum. 
And I had been writing down the notes that my mom had told me just so that I would have it. And then Sarah, my daughter, would have it for later. And I called my mom to tell her I was thinking of doing this. And her, her answer to me was, I can't believe that they would care what would happen to a 12-year-old little girl in Hiroshima. I, I can't believe they would want to read that. And so a few days later, I received this package in the mail. And it's a copy of a picture. Um, we didn't have a lot of Japanese culture or decorations in our home, but we did have this place of honor where my mom kept this picture of her and her papa. And it was so important to her, uh, one, because she only had six photos from her childhood, and they were all with her about between the ages of three and five. Uh, anything newer than that would have been destroyed with her home in the bombing. And the other reason is that her papa was her favorite person in the whole world, and she loved him so much. And I could tell from when she would talk about him and the stories of what he would say to her that he felt the same way about her as well. And so when I saw that, all I could think was, you know, she had so much more than just August 6th and what happened. And she had happy times, and she had, um, um, Oh, no, Joe, I'm, I'm okay. I'll do the slides after. Thank you, though. Uh, and so she had happy times as well. So I decided I was going to start the book almost a year before the bomb was dropped. I really wanted to give a feeling of the culture of Japan at that time, um, the mindset of the people, the, uh, what they were learning in their own news, whatever propaganda was being brought to them, uh, as well as... Um, the way that they looked at their political leaders, which was different than what the allied people had. But to also then tell, um, you know, they started war in 1931. Uh, Japan had invaded Manchuria. My mother was born in 1932. So she really only knew war in the background of her life. And so also by 1945, uh, a lot of the resources were depleted at that point. And a lot of the young men had, were fighting out in the Pacific. And although Hiroshima was once a big military port, by the time it was 1945, there were more elderly and women and children that were there. So I really had hoped by being able to do this, um, I could also share this, that the children in Japan, like my mom, they love their families, they love their friends, they worried what would happen to them, and they wished for peace. And that was everything that the allied children were also thinking and wishing. So I really hope that it would then give more than just what my daughter had of those two paragraphs and a picture of a mushroom cloud and a textbook. I think that the kids who were talking about the cloud, they weren't doing it to be mean or cruel. They just didn't know. They didn't know the story. They didn't have that connection. So I really hope that my book could be something that would do that. And I also realized, too, that the books that were currently being used in school, um, one of them being uh, the... John Hersey book, Hiroshima, that I read in high school. But also there was another book, uh, Sadako and the 1000 Paper Cranes um, by Eleanor Kerr, a Canadian-American author. And Sadako's true story is very poignant and it's very heartbreaking. And to me, it's also very inspiring. But with that particular book, um, the author changed the ending because she I'm not really sure why she did, but what it was is that Sadako actually folded 1,600 cranes before she passed away. According to the, the, the uh, legend was if you fold 1,000 cranes, um, you can have uh, good, good wishes, good health. And in the book, she said that she didn't fold them all and that people had to do them afterwards when she passed away. So I wanted them to really have something that came from a lens of not from a white American or a white Canadian American. And, but from someone who was a 12-year-old girl living in Hiroshima, what her life was like then with her family, and then what she experienced and how, what she lost afterwards. That was really uh, my hope to be able to do that. So what I thought I would do is to read um, uh, one of the chapters from The Last Cherry Blossom. Now, before I go to that, I just want to preface it with um, my mom always said that she had two coincidences that day of August 6th. The first was that she was sick over the weekend. Monday um, was August 6th, and her papa said, you can stay home one more day, and then you can join your classmates. Her classmates were in the center of town, taking down the wooden buildings, uh, because the, um, 
Im immense fire bombs that happened in Tokyo in March 1945 had decimated a lot of Tokyo very quickly. And so they hoped that by taking down the wooden bu buildings there, they would not um, burn as quickly. So her classmates were in the center of town that day. Now also her papa had his own uh, small newspaper company in Hiroshima and he would work from home in the morning and then he'd go into the center of town to his office in the afternoon. But that particular day he was going in early. He was going to the train station to purchase a train ticket for one of his employees um, that had an injured son on the other part of Japan. And so that put him in the center of town at 8.15 that day. So the part that I'm going to read basically um, takes place the day of the bombing. It's some hours later and her stepmother, uh, Sumio, tells my mom that we need to go look for Papa. And Papa um, was at the train station, so they know they have quite a ways to walk and they're not quite sure how far it's going to be for them because the roads were torn up and um, the landmarks were gone. And as they're heading towards what they hope is the area of the train station, um, they hear somebody calling their name. And it was actually somebody, um, an employee, and he was with her papa and he said, he's alive, he's hurt, but I can take you to him where I left him at the train station. So they walk all this way and they go towards part of what was left of the train station and her papa's not there. And so she, they really are happy because they feel, well, he must be heading back toward us. So we need to go and head back towards him. So this would be chapter 28. I held tightly to Sumio's hand as we left the shell of what was once a bustling train station. I kept hoping to see Papa walking toward us with every step we took. I squeezed Sumio's hand as a silent sign of hope. She squeezed my hand in return. Sumio tripped over some concrete steps. I grabbed her arm to steady her. She gasped, your Papa, he is right here. My heart pounded hard in my chest. I looked up. In my excitement, I hadn't noticed that Sumio was looking at the ground and not ahead of her. She had not tripped on a step, but rather on Papa. I looked down and saw a person whose head was twice its normal size and flushed in a strange shade of blue. At first glance, I thought Sumio was mistaken, but then I looked closer and recognized the three-piece suit he had worn that morning when he left home. I could see some of the familiarity of the facial features as I stared at his head more closely. I forced to utter, is he alive? Sumio checked his neck for a pulse. Yes, there is a faint pulse. She smiled. And for the first time that day, her voice held hope. We need to bring him back to our house. There will be help for him there. But your papa is a big man and you and I cannot carry him alone. And then they hear the familiar voice of Okada-san, which is the name that I gave the employee, um, up behind them. I think I saw a wheelbarrow on my way here. Let me see if I can get it so we can get him home. In a matter of minutes, Okada-san had returned with a small wheelbarrow. He and Sumio struggled, but managed to lift Papa's frame into the cart. That was when I noticed that Papa's tie was loosened and his shoes were gone. His feet were engorged. In the vest where he once carried a pocket watch was a strange wound that looked like a hole that seemed to be melting his skin. Sumio placed Papa's hand in the wagon and covered the wound I had been staring at with part of his vest. Okada-san pushed the cart over crumbled concrete and melted tar to where our neighborhood once stood. We passed what was left of our city hospital. So many burn victims waited in line along the one wall of the building that remained. My fists tapped at my legs as I repeated in my head, Papa will be fine, Papa will be fine. I heard a moan. Papa's head fell to the side and his arm dangled off the wagon. No, Sumio-san began to sob. It seemed as if I were watching a movie play out in front of me. Okada-san reached down and pressed his finger against Papa's neck. Then he touched Papa's wrist and shook his head at Sumio-san. He turned around and I saw him wipe his eyes with his hands. I looked at Papa's lifeless body in the wheelbarrow with his head the color of navy blue and enlarged like a blowfish. But I didn't see that man. Instead, I saw my Papa dressed in his handsome three-piece suit, Panama hat and shoes that he personally shined with great care. Later, I didn't see him on the funeral pyre where Sumio sat with him. I saw him walking away, proudly twirling his walking stick, as he did when he walked me to school. Loneliness spread through me like a poison. 
I tried to imagine Papa hugging me in a loving embrace. I strained to smell the scent of his cologne. I wanted to sob until I could no longer breathe, but the tears would not fall. It was as if the intense heat of the blast had dried them all up. Um, I always get emotional when I do that because I hear my mom's voice. And she was not one to cry in public or to show too, too much emotion if she didn't want to. And she would cry and talk about it as if she was seeing it happening all over again in front of her. <clears throat> I was really blessed to have her for 82 years. and She was not sick until the last few months of her life. She also knew that the book was going to be published. I had gotten the contract in 2014 in November. Um, so she got to have it and she took that contract and she put it next to her papa's picture to show him uh, and thanked me for honoring him but I was also honoring her and for some reason she didn't seem to see it I'm so glad that I got to do that because um, she passed away um, a couple months later so um, what I thought I would do is try to transition and look at a few slides please <clears throat> Thank you, Joy. This is the picture of my mom and her papa that had a very honorable place in our home. And now I have it in a place of honor in mine. Um, I was very lucky the publisher put the picture in the book as well. So I was really happy with that. She was about four years old in that picture with her papa. In the next slide uh, is the Ishikawa family. Uh, you've got um, her cousin, her papa, and her stepmother, Sumio, an aunt, and an uncle. And this was a third cousin that she used to come uh, to type for her papa in the mornings. Now, um, she's not mentioned in the book, uh, but these people are. And I'm not going to say too much about it uh, if you haven't read the book yet. But this part right here was cut out. And my mom was in that picture. And she cut herself out of it because she felt guilty that she was the only one that was still alive in that picture. The next slide, please. This is in front of my mom's house. Uh, it was a two-story house. And um, on the day of the bombing, the only thing that was left were the two cement pillars on either side of the concrete wall. Everything else um, was down to the ground. She's probably three here. It's kind of hard to see. It's a little fuzzy. Um, and in the next one is a map of the Hiroshima bombing. Um, when we went to honor my mom in 2015 to Hiroshima, and we went to the um, Memorial Hall for atomic bomb victims, I was able to um, give them the address of where my mom lived, and they were able to pull out an old map and be able to find where it was. Now, my mom always said that it was quite a ways to get there, but when we finally matched it up where this purple arrow is, was her home, and the red square here is the epicenter. And so my mom was a little less than two miles from the epicenter, which to me was even more miraculous that she survived. She did have a building fall on top of her, which probably took away from the initial uh, blast of the radiation, but um, it was pretty... Um, interesting to find that out. I think that's my last slide. And I would like to then, yes, that would be Naomi. I'd like to then pass this over to Naomi to hear her perspective on living on the West Coast of growing up as a second gen Habaksha. Thank you so much, Kathleen. Um, your whole pres presentation was just wonderful. And um, the reading was so moving. I think this is the second time I've heard you read that and it still is so impactful. Um, this is exciting for both of us to be together because I think you being living at, in North Carolina and being raised on the East Coast, it, it's very different from my experience and my both my parents are Hibaksha, are considered Hibaksha. Um, my father was uh, born in farmland in Watsonville, California. And when he was three, he was taken over um, with the rest of the family to Hiroshima, where he lived until about like 1947. 
Um, so, and he was at the train station. I, I just noted in the chat, Aya Tasaki mentions that her grandmother was also at the train station as well. So it's kind of eerie to hear these intersection of lives, right? That happened, people who were there in, in Hiroshima on August 6, 1945. My mother um, is a Shin Ise, um, or a post-war immigrant like your mother. Um, and she uh, is from Hiroshima Shi or the city of Japan, I mean, city of Hiroshima. And her uh, parents owned a stationery store. And um, her uh, grandfather, her father, my uh, maternal grandfather, was drafted into the Japanese army, even though he was older with three children. You know, there were the J Japan was so desperate, right, for manpower. He never was sent overseas. He just stayed in Hiroshima, and actually, he was supposed to be released from um, duty. Uh, in a, you know, like uh, at least, you know, several days before, but there was some problem with the paperwork. So um, he was totally in ground zero. Like, I think it was like the Naval headquarters or something. Um, so, um, and whereas my mother who was eight, um, she was actually in the countryside. So they knew that Hiroshima, you know, was kind of had some sort of military connections so um some children were sent to like a temple like out in the country and my mother was sent to one of these places but of course they didn't know um, what kind of bomb this was right so my grandmother who did survive and my uncle they took her from the countryside into hiroshima city to search for you know my grandfather kind of like what you were saying. And, um, but you know, this is radiation. Nobody knew about radiation poisoning and all that. And I know my mother tells a story that they um, prepared rice balls or nigiri for the search in the rubble. And for some reason that always stayed with me because like the purity of onigiri just being white, you know, against the black rain and everything that was going on in Hiroshima at the time. Um, my mother is not, and she's still alive today, she's still with us, uh, thankfully. Um, she is not one for emotion as well. Um, so, um, it, you know, so it's, it's uh, I, I think I mentioned this um, earlier in our meeting greet, but I think she's able to com compartmentalize all these different um, emotions. And I think what's interesting too is both our mothers married Americans. In your case, it was a white American. And in my case, um, it was a Kibe Nise. You know, he's American, although he spoke mostly Japanese, he was, he's still an American. So there is indeed a contradiction in all of that, right? Like, why would you, an atomic bomb survivor, marry an American and live in America? So I think our perspectives are really interested in that way. Growing up, I, you know, I had a very different um, upbringing than you did. Um, I live in Southern California in the middle of Japanese America. Um, there's so, you know, uh, Hiroshima sent the biggest number of immigrants to um, Hawaii and mainland um, uh, U.S. than any other prefecture, right? So, so many of us Japanese Americans have ties to Hiroshima. And in fact, my father, um, the high school, Hiroshima Koryo, where he went to, there's a number of uh, Kibe Niseis like my father that live here in California. And in fact, um, one of his classmates, uh, Mr. Arai, you know, my, notice that there's a similarity in his name and my sleuth. Um, was a, a, a family friend. My father was a gardener and there was a whole network of Japanese American, you know, that was one of the most uh, pop, well, popular professions. Well, it was one of the occupations that Japanese Americans could do after being released from either camp or coming from Japan. You know, all you needed was a beat up old 
truck and a push mower and you were in business, there was this um, image that Japanese um, could make things grow. In some cases, it was true, but in other cases, it wasn't true. So it was this halo effect. No matter if you, even if you killed plants, you would, you can get an occupation being a gardener. So I was part of that whole social network of um, Japanese American gardeners, you know, families. So I went to, although my school, my the first school I attended, um, I was a product of desegregation in Pasadena. It, it was like 50% black. And then we moved to an area that's mostly white. But all throughout, I went to a Japanese American church. I went to play Japanese American basketball. Um, and I went to language school. I went to Japanese language school. And Kathleen, you didn't miss anything because we didn't really learn that much. So, and, um, so this Mr. Arai, which actually he, his photo is part of the um, Daryl Miho photo exhibit that's at the museum right now. He had this terrible scar, keloid scar on his neck. And I was like this good Japanese, you know, American girl that I did not ask a probing question. I, I, I never asked, why does he have that ugly scar? You know, it's just something you kind of observe. And later when I worked at the Rough I, I, you know, we, we received like this AP photo as Mr. Arai. And it turned out he had gotten it because he had been a survivor of the Hiroshima blast. So, um, so I lived in this kind of world where, you know, I spoke Japanese. Sure, I fought against it. You know, it's like whenever we went into like department store, I would tell my mother, speak English. But, you know, still, you know, all of those things, you know, were part of my life for sure. Um, one thing I will say, uh, one anecdote I do have is my parents belong to the Committee of Atomic Bomb Survivors, CABS, um, and um, we received a manila envelope. Um, and I had taken, used that envelope for something else, and I had taken it to school. This is a school that was mostly white white um, uh, South Pasadena junior high. And one of my classmates had seen that envelope and the return, you know, address. It said Committee of Atomic Bomb Survivors. And he was going, what? You know, and he said, oh, no wonder that's why you're so short. You know, he made some kind of comment like that. And it kind of, you know, that was like one of the few times where I felt self-conscious. Like, oh, is that what, you know, am I a defect? fact in some ways. And um, so, you know, that's one kind of thing that kind of stayed in my mind. Another thing that has stayed in my mind too was when we were visiting Hiroshima, because my I have more relatives over there than over here. Um, one of my relatives who was younger than me, I was like 14, said to me, oh, I don't like America because you Americans dropped the bomb. You know, he said that to me. And I was like, so confused, like my dad, who is a Kibe Nisei, he's an American, he's a survivor, you know, and how can you, to him, everything was black and white, you know, and whereas we know in history, you know, in terms of like Japan's occupation of other parts of Asia, everything is a more complicated than that just one paradigm. So I think that's what kind of pushed me to write about um, a person like Masarai, um, who was a Kibe Nesu, who was an American, who happened to be raised in Japan and caught over there. And I thought it would be a way that I could tell the story of the Hibaksha, not necessarily in, in a polemic way or didactic way, but in a way that maybe American readers could be open because here's this cranky old, you know, Japanese American guy, you know, they could probably identify him with him and go on this journey. So um, those were the reasons why I um, wrote a, you know, a, a wrote a book with Masarai at, at center. And um, I was very close to my own father. So when you kind of talk about your mother's relationship with um, her, with Papa, you know, I was like very tight with my father as well. And um, so um, I think uh, he was a man, a few words in terms of the outside. 
and um, you know, he 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 didn't speak English that well, and he didn't speak Japanese that well either. <laughs> so he had this own language that you know we you know his children could understand, and I wanted to take a person like that and give him agency, make him the star of a story. Um, there's an African American detective writer, um, Walter Mosley, said who said he wanted to write about black heroes. And um, that's what I wanted to do in my character, Masurai. So um, can we look at the, some of the slides, Miss Joy? Oh, I forgot. I'm supposed to read. You could keep that up. Um, I'm going to read a section from my first book, um, Summer of the Big Bachi. And if for those of you who don't know what bachi means it's a very big bachi what um comes around goes around that's what it means it, it's a very um useful expression <laughs> so um this is kind of it has some parallels to what you read kathleen so the bomb has already um, fallen and my character moss now he this was common among um, young people um, who were not in the military. They suspended school at some point during World War II um, for, older, uh, for older students. And they had to do something like, you know, like this maybe tear down fences or wood, like you said, Kathleen. In my dad's case, and this is the photo of him to the left, he had to um, work at the train station. So that was his um, activity um, in 1945. Um, so Moss is with uh, two of his fellow students right now. And um, so, and then Georgie, um, his friend is um, a Kibe Nise like him. Moss felt the remains of his breakfast Oh, you could go back to me, I guess, Joy. <laughs> Moss felt the remains of his breakfast, a roasted sweet potato, come up his throat. He vomited as people continued to push toward the river and bump him from all sides. No time for that, Masao, said Ricky, gripping the shreds of cloth around Moss's neck like a leash. Georgie, where was Georgie? This way, this way. At the edge of the bridge lay a long, skinny body. Ricky played the burnt body over his shoulder as if it were a sack of rice. The arms and legs dangled lifelessly, and then Moss recognized the work boots. He's alive, said Ricky, barely. It seemed as though they walked for days. All the landmarks, the corner drugstore, the stationery shop, the public bath had disappeared. Only one wall of the once majestic government office stood, now a giant tombstone marking a mass grave. The body of a man who apparently had been resting on a cement stoop remained burnt in its place. Is this all we are? Bits of dust, ash? How could life leave so quickly? Moss wiped his face with his black hands and for the first time in a long time, felt tears spring up to his eyes. Were his parents still alive? What about his brothers and sisters? All he wanted was his flat, hay-filled futon lined up with the others. He wanted to rest, close his eyes, and wake up to a new bright Hiroshima day. Masa's legs, which had been numb, were starting to buckle underneath him. Let's rest for a while, said Ricky, lowering Georgie into the ground. Onto the ground. Georgie's broken body was singed black, but his eyes were alert and wide open. He's trying to tell you something, said Ricky. Ah, Georgie rasped. Moss placed his ear by Georgie's blistered lips. Georgie tried again. Ah, get. Moss understood. Akemi, right? Don't worry, Georgie. I'm sure she's all right. But Georgie would not be comforted. I promise you, Moss finally said. I promise to find her. Rain then began to fall softly, almost kindly. At least Georgie would have some water to drink, thought Moss. Then he looked down at his bare hands and arms, black streaks, black rain. Moss glanced at Ricky. 
They did not say anything, but they both knew this was no ordinary bomb. You go ahead, Ricky said. Go home. Get your brothers to help. No, I can't leave you and Georgie. I can't go any further. I'll watch him. We'll make it. Something in Ricky's voice sounded strange, but then everything was off balance and unfamiliar. Moss nodded and continued on to the hills to home. When he finally saw a patch of green, he began to run until he could touch the blades of tall grasses. When he turned back toward R Ricky and Georgie, he could barely see them, merely stick figures in the steaming, ravaged landscape. Was one of the figures walking away from the other? Moss tried to focus, but could not. He knew that he should turn back and check on Georgie, but instead he collapsed and immediately fell asleep in the bed of green grasses. So that was a section from Summer of the Bibachi. So slides, please. So yeah, so that's Is Isamu and my, my parents have nicknames too, but they weren't as jarring as Betty <laughs> and to, for Toshiko. Um, my dad went by Sam, which if you reverse the letters is Moss. Isn't that kind of interesting? So um, my dad, since his family lived in the countryside, he does have some early photos. So, um, but this one was during World War II, and um, it, he has this photo album, and um, and that has a lot of his friends in them. And um, when you were talking about nightmares, nightmares is a common thing in the Hirahara family as well. And my dad, he passed away from uh, stomach cancer about eight years ago, but when he was in the hospital on medication, it was um, he would talk about um, his classmates who didn't make it. So I think that whole notion of survivor's guilt, you know, and that photo that of your mother's family in which she cut out her own photo, I think that is very similar and that it resonates with me um, as well. Um, unlike Kathleen though, we have a lot of ties to contemporary Hiroshima so I first went to Hiroshima, this photo to the right is actually me. You know, that was my, um, <laughs> that's when I was the cutest when I was three years old. That was uh, me with my mother. And um, we had gone, we, we've gone to Japan together a number of times, but this was the first time. And this is in, uh, in front of one of the home, a relative's homes, 1965. Next slide, please. Um, and, you know, um, the photo to the right, and Kathleen tells me she uses this photo too, um, is of the train station, um, the remains, and, and my dad had, um, he, he recalled much of the same kind of um, imagery that you've written about Kathleen, like the fires everywhere, you know, those kind of things, the rubble, and um, on Google Maps, it kind of shows you um, so the episode where the peace memorial is to the right of this Google map, if you were to walk it today to the train station, it would um, take you about 32 minutes. So it's about two kilometers away. So next slide, please. Oh, okay. That's about it. For me, um, for right now. So back to you, Kathleen, and you could maybe just go back to Kathleen now. <laughs> oh, you're muted. You're muted. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, sorry about that. In this part, what I wanted to discuss a little bit of was why I keep speaking to students um, and to future voters um, and to readers about my mother's story. Sometimes someone would, um, someone asked me, well, you know, you're coming up on 75 years. So why does the story keep matter? Why does it matter? And my thought is, is that, you know, time will go by, technology can change, but 
the need for human connection through our emotions and our heart, that's timeless. And I feel that in order to speak to the students, for them to understand uh, the humanity under those clouds, you know, that um, each person there was someone's child, like my mom or uh, Naomi's papa, father and, and my mom's papa. So they're, they're people. And I think one of the biggest things too is that the statistics are important and they make a good point as well as the need to have treaties to ban nuclear weapons are also very important. But if the voters or future voters don't relate and connect to the people under those clouds that day as human beings and don't want it to happen to their own family, then it's not gonna matter. The statistics and the research, that doesn't matter anymore. So that's why I wanna keep talking to people to keep showing that kind of um, connection that it's not just those famous mushroom clouds, there are people that were underneath there. So what I'd like to do is kind of show you in these slides of what I've tried to do to keep that connection going to my mother's story. Um, if you could please, Joy. Thank you. Um, in 2017, I partnered with Green Legacy Hiroshima and what they do is they go and they collect seeds from trees that survived the atomic bombing. They grow them into saplings and then they send them out to various countries all over the world as a sign of peace. So in September of 2017, I was able to make North Carolina the seventh state in the US to have one of these peace trees. We planted it at the University of North Carolina in Wilmington. Uh, my daughter was going to college there at that time and she spearheaded the fundraising and worked with her um, Japanese professor in the Japan Club to set up uh, a time when they could commemorate it and also for uh, the funds to be able to put the plaque and to plant the tree. Um, and it was a wonderful moment because when my daughter picked the UNC Wilmington to be the place where we would put the tree sapling because it was the only college that my mom got to tour with her. And she felt that if people were coming from the education building and they're walking past this tree and someday when it's grown enough, it can, they can then read the plaque and they can understand why it's planted there and that it's for peace. Um, and they did dedicate it in the memory of the Ishikawa family, as well as to all atomic bomb victims and all the victims of the World War. The uh, next slide. Thank you. I just wanted to show what the mother ginkgo tree looked like in Hiroshima. This was shortly after the atomic bombing uh, and uh, it's in the Shuken Gardens. I'm probably pronouncing that incorrectly, uh, but I wanted to kind of show you that even in the midst of all that, there was still something that was blooming um, and that would continue to bloom. Uh, in the next slide, in uh, December of 2018, I was very lucky when the uh, COO of the United Nations Office of Disarmament Affairs had read my book and had wanted to add it as an education resource for teachers and students. And when he told me that, I did my little chair happy dance and I was amazed that something like that would happen. Uh, and then a few months later, I was humbled when I was invited to go uh, to the United Nations in New York City to be able to honor my mom and to talk about the last cherry blossom and have a book signing at the United Nations bookshop and also to be able to work um, at a session with New York City teachers who wanted to find ways to add nuclear disarmament uh, into their classroom. And I had uh, the privilege of being able to work alongside uh, Dr. Kathleen Sullivan who happens to be one of the uh, Nobel Peace Prize winners of 2017. She's under the umbrella of the International uh, Commission to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, and it's also known as ICANN. So her, along with, uh, you may have heard of Setsuko Thurlow, she has been a driving force uh, and a voice of the Hibakusha and has worked with ICANN in the United Nations for the treaty to abolish nuclear weapons. 
Uh, and she also won the Nobel Peace Prize as a part of that. So to be able to speak with these people and to meet with teachers who really felt the compassion to have nuclear disarmament in their classroom, it was a very magical time for me and it was very surreal. And, um, you know, I, I just, to be able to talk about my mom there was, was really incredible. And out of that, uh, NHK World Japan um, had come down to Charlotte, North Carolina to interview my daughter and I about the start of telling my mother's story in the book. And then they accompanied me to one of the presentations that I was doing at a local school in Davidson. And it ended up uh, going on, um, a segment of it was on TV in Japan on a Japanese program called Today's 2020. And then they showed it on their English station in English uh, for the uh, Newsroom Tokyo segment. And all I could think was, you know, my mom's story is being shown in her country. Uh, it's being talked about in her language. And, you know, here she goes, always thinking that no one would really care about that little girl in Hiroshima. And so I hope that she now sees that people do. Um, in the uh, next slide. The 75th anniversary of Hiroshima and Nagasaki was last week, uh, 6th and 9th. There is a coalition of about 120 uh, uh, businesses or companies uh, that actively fight against nuclear, dis for nuclear disarmament, I'm sorry. So they put together this uh, website, HiroshimaNagasaki75.org. And there you could learn about all the other initiatives they were doing, what actions they were doing, and how people can get involved with nuclear disarmament also for being able to sign the Hibakusha appeal uh, that is there, which the Hibakusha are continuing to get these signatures uh, to bring to the United Nations, and they will keep collecting signatures until there is nuclear disarmament that actually happens. I was also um, very honored when they said that I would be able to go live, my daughter and I, to be able to talk about my mom and to tell her story as well um, during their day-long of programs for that. So it was really uh, a touching thing to be able to do with my daughter uh, and, and talk about it because she's the one that started things. And uh, I think that would have made my mom very, very happy, very proud. Uh, in the uh, next slide, I wanted to show some pictures of my mom. Uh, this first one over here was in the 60s, uh, probably mid 60s, uh, when she became a citizen. Uh, this picture is of myself, my mom, and my daughter Sarah when she was six months old. Uh, my mom always talked about us as the three generation of Ishikawa women. So um, it's one of the few ones I have of the three of us together, actually. Um, this picture over here on the right is the last uh, one of the last pictures that I had taken with my mom before she passed away. And here I always like to show is a picture of my daughter when she was in seventh grade that started with that phone call with my mom. She's not always happy when I show it because she's 23 now, but she actually approved of it this time. Um, and I just want to end my piece of this here with, um, oh, I think that's for Naomi. Thank you, Joy. Uh, that my mother was the bravest person I will ever know. And I am honored that she would entrust myself and my daughter with her memories that she didn't share with everyone um, and to share her heart. And as a second generation of Baksha, my daughter being a third, we're going to continue to keep telling her story. And not for blame, my mom always said that war was hell for both sides, but so that people remember that it happened to people. And so hopefully that the message will also get out there that the ones that we might think are different from us or don't belong or are enemy, not really so different from us after all. We all have that human connection. And uh, I will continue to talk about her story for that. So I thank you for listening to my piece. And I want to hand it now over to Naomi uh, to talk about her research that she did in Hiroshima. I really enjoyed learning about your Western perspective of growing up as a second gen Baksha because it was so different from mine. Um, I'm a little jealous for some of it. <laughs> but thank you, Joy. Uh -huh. So, um, you know, I wish that we had a choice 
in terms of reactions like there needs to be a hug thing yes, yes. <laughs> because i want to hug you i want to hug you too <laughs> you know um i i want to do say this it is very tough to and um emotional i think for both of us um maybe more so for you kathleen than me um maybe because i'm not fully evolved emotionally <laughs> as you are but i i think i think it could be more isolating maybe where you are in charlotte whereas there's more people here that you know and there's a lot more activities you know i i could walk to places where i know okay that temple has the peace flame from hiroshima you know there's more touch points i think but um yeah let's let's um i wanted we wanted to kind of end at a look at hiroshima today in terms of my research trip to, to Hiroshima to do the final Masarai mystery, which is called Hiroshima Boy. Um, so can you show the first slide, Joy? Um, you know, I just recently listened to a podcast um, with Japan Times called Deep Dive, and they highlighted um, Hiroshima. And there was a couple things there that I was unaware of. One, that there was a city uh, a citizens group that decided after the bomb on um, some certain mandates. One mandate was that Hiroshima would be a city of peace. So it's no accident. You know, some people actually thought it through. And so certain, even certain landmarks, um, like this, um, when I did research, I stayed in a place close to here, uh, Peace Boulevard, Heiwadori, you know. And if you walk through Hiroshima, um, even very simple places have a monument, not only the, the Genbaku Dome, the main dome, but other locations will say this was here before the bomb. So it, it's a city that's very committed to peace. But another thing is it's a really fun, cool city and there's a lot of trees. And, and um, what Kathleen had mentioned about the ginkgo tree brought to mind because in the podcast, they said that this citizens group asked for every prefecture from Japan after the bomb to send a tree over. So that's why in Hiroshima there are some trees that are older than 75 years. Um, um, not because they survived the bombing but because they came from other places. So I thought that was really beautiful. Next slide. So when I did my research I went with my husband and I made, um, uh, we stayed at an Airbnb and I wanted to live like a typical, like maybe working class Hiroshima person in the city. And so this to the left, our, uh, <laughs> my husband was actually kind of upset <laughs> at our living situation because it was like a six mat room and the faucet for the bathtub was the same. We had to pull it. It was the same faucet for our sink. So it was very cramped but it had two very wonderful features. One, it had air conditioning because we went um, in July, August, which is, I mean, we're in really record breaking heat right now in Los Angeles, but it's so hot with the humidity together, which is a killer. And it also had a washer. So as long as we had the washer and the air conditioning, and because it was so small, that room got cold very quickly. Um, to the left is um, Nagare Dori, which is one of um, the major uh, boulevards in Hiroshima. So as we can see, it's very lively and it's a really fun place with great food, okonomiyaki, and um, it's known for oysters and just a lot of great things. So next slide. Um, and I think this may be my last slide. Instead of showing you the regular Hiroshima slides that you've all seen, um, I wanted to sh uh, show you Ninoshima, which is a small, actually on the slide to the left, we are already on Ninoshima looking out at other small islands outside of Hiroshima. Um, Ninoshima is an island that's about a 15 minute uh, ferry ride a, um, from Ujina, the main port of Hiroshima. It is part of Hiroshima city. Um, and on this, this island is notable because after the bombing, 
and everything's destroyed in the city, people would go out on rafts or anything um, to escape the heat, the humidity, the de you know devastation, and they went over to Hiroshima. And Hiroshima still had structures and in, intact structures. So there, were, um, the people of the island were helping um, the survivors. And unfortunately, many of the survivors died on that island. So um, this, this um, on the left, where we're at right now is um, it. This is a home now for kind of. Um, I, I don't I don't know what would you call it. you know how today we have like boys and girls homes for people who are have family issues and all that that's what this particular place is the school is but it first started out to be an orphanage for um, children who had lost their parents during the bombing and then also on an island is a retirement home one of the very first retirement homes in Japan, which was created for the um, serve, uh, uh, elderly who lost their parents, because it used to be that the children would always would help the parents as they age. And that particular retirement home is um, operated by my relatives, my mother's uh, um, relatives. So uh, when I did research, I knew that for the, the final Masurai mystery, I wanted to set it in a place where there's not much police presence and there's no police on Inoshima. And as a result, that gave an opening for my aging gardener, Kibe Nise Gardener, Masarai, to solve the crime. So, and also it has some really interesting history that I, I thought that m many people were not familiar with. And I've also written a nonfiction piece on Ninoshima that you could search for. Joy, you could probably find it um, if you want to find out the real history. I, I actually fic fictionalized the island in my book. I call it Ino Island, but it's called Ninoshima. And finally, um, this shed, this gardening shed, um, which is uh, surrounded by these flower fields that an elderly woman takes care of, this is actually a makeshift um, museum because what they're continually finding bones of people who died on Ninoshima as they do various um, construction projects. So this museum, it, it's very humble. They have just like black and white Xerox photos that show some of the things they found that talks about. Um, so this is Ninoshima's kind of like peace museum in this gardening shed, which is tro totally appropriate for my my person, Masarai. So, um, you know, I was going to read something, but in the interest of time, let's just take some questions. So, uh, yeah, these are our books right now. And um, yeah, oh, okay, yeah, I see the a Q and A. So I'll 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 do yep. the Q and A feature. Okay. Um, so, Kioni, I'm going to get to your question in a second. So let's see. Let's okay. Let's take James Thomas' question first. What challenges did you have in writing fiction about an important historical event? For example, were there issues with creating dramatic tension or narrative while staying true and accurate to history? So for you, Kathleen. That's a really good question. Um, it was in a way, I, I had an extra layer of it being difficult because it was my mom. So I kept thinking of her as my mom and I had to kind of get away from that a little bit um, and try to imagine what would have happened in that se section. For me, I used a lot of historical research for it. And um, what I really changed were the events in my mom's life in the order that they happened. So I tried to then imagine what the actual conversations would be in trying to stick to what was going on at that time. So sometimes I had asked my mom, you know, what did you do in this situation or what happened here to kind of get a better idea for it. But um, I think I was stuck on it more because it was my mother and I couldn't get past, you know, her being young and what she would have done at that age. So that was more my issue. Um, 
Oh yeah, there was this one question that we wanted to address too, was um, there was a movie that was proposed to be made from the Sadako and a Thousand Cranes. And it was um, to be told from the viewpoint of the author, um, the white Canadian author, like she was gonna be the one to tell the story of Hiroshima. And actually Kathleen has, she um, this spurred her to write some essays about this. So Kathleen, why don't you talk about that a little bit? Sure. Um, last year, it was talked about that they were in pre-production for a story about Sadako and the Thousand Paper Cranes. And um, it may not even be made now, considering with COVID and whatnot. But uh, at that time, the uh, director had said that they were going to go by a particular version that was not Eleanor Kerr's. It was, um, I'm going to say his name correctly. It was e I thought I had his name here, but I can't find it. Uh, but a different version of that. Uh, let's see. Oh, Taka, Takayuki Ishii. And they were going to use that, which was very much uh, true to what Sadako's life was. But the weird thing then was that they said they were going to put in the author, Eleanor Kerr, and have her, from her viewpoint of how things happened and how um, she and Sadako from both different sides of the world brought together uh, the meaning of peace and, and, uh, in Hiroshima and, and the cranes and the folding. And, and I think what really got to me was that if it's a film about Sadako and her life experience, then why do we need to have this author in there um, who didn't want to write her real story of Sadako and change the ending? Um, and why shouldn't it just be about Sadako and her family or the, the, the atomic bomb survivors? I think it, it would take away from it to have that author in there. I have nothing against her personally, and I think she's a very talented author, but she doesn't belong in that story. And I think it just kind of bothered me where, you know, they wanted to try to put a white lens on it. And I, that's why I was so upset, because I wanted it to be told, it should be told from the Hiroshima perspective. From what they went through. They, they don't need someone white coming in and telling the story and sort of like they, they kind of made it better out of a horrible situation because that's not what it was. I really felt that you needed to have a movie that would tell what actually happened and what they actually went through. Um, no blaming, just this is what happened. And then you can leave that theater knowing we don't want to do it again. You don't want to leave the theater saying, oh, it was a horrible thing that happened, but we had to do it. But look the, at the good that came out of it. I, I just felt that if you did that type of movie with Eleanor Kerr being the main person, then you take away everything from the people that were under those clouds and what they suffered with. So that is what I really had um, the issue with. Um, so I'll get off my soapbox. <laughs> Yeah, please Google uh, Kathleen's article and you can read all of it. Um, I'm going to read um, Aya Tasaki's question. Thank you both so much for sharing your heart and stories. As a third generation Hibakusha on both paternal and maternal lineages born and raised in Japan, I have great frustration in having Hibakusha stories being told completely separately from the greater context of incredible atrocities committed by Japan in other Asian countries. I don't think our family stories will be honored to the extent it deserves or have the weight it has until we can tell it in the bigger context of imperialism and colonialism that continue to affect our world today. Have either of you come across spaces that strive to do this, to lift up Hibakusha stories in a more interconnected, intersectional manner? Thank you. Um, I'll answer that first, um, because actually that's what I'm attempting to do with my Masurai mystery series. Um, the first book, Summer of Big Bachi, was probably, I, um, it's a little subtle, um, but kind of key to the whole mystery is that, um, and so, sorry, spoiler alert, there's a piece of land that is has become very valuable and one of the reasons why is because Koreans who are forced to work for um, the Japanese military you know um, their bones are like there you know from World War II so but it's very oblique I, I'll be the first to say it's very oblique it's not um, super obvious um, and but what is interesting is 
I've had two books published in Japanese. Um, I won an Edgar Allan Poe for award for Snakeskin Shamisen. So that was published, that was translated as well as Gasa Gasa Girl, but they did not pick up Summer of the Big Bachi. Um, it could be because there are more things about the bombing, but it also could be these oblique, you know, messages about Koreans in um, and their experience in Japan. Um, I, it could have been a turnoff. So, um, so I think the nice thing about a series is like I could kind of tackle those kind of issues that you talk about, Aya. And in my what was it? I, I lost track if it was sixth or seventh. Oh uh, no, I mean fifth or sixth. I think that my sixth book, Sayonara Slam. I mean, I use baseball kind of as a way to talk about relations between Korea, Korea and Japan and also um, reference the comfort women. Um, I, when I worked at the Rafu Shimpo as an editor, that was something we covered all the time because um, that was in the 1990s. And that's when um, the topic of reparations for comfort women was a real hot issue. So um, I am myself attempting to do that, but it is tricky because just the way I think the public is, everyone wants to see things, like I mentioned before, as black and white, and it's, this is good, these are good people, these are bad people, and it, you know, it's not, to a mystery. So I think that's kind of a good way to kind of tackle all these complexities that you mentioned. Yeah. I, Kathleen? I, I didn't really cover too much of that. We could highlight those stories um, because sometimes I will get comments about when I talk about what happened to my mom that, well, you know, they, this happened. They did, you know, they had the comfort women and and I think all those stories need to be told, but I don't think it should be told to say, well, this, they did this, so they deserve that, because that's not how it was. I think that what we need to be able to do is have their stories told. They're very, very important, but they should be told to kind of coexist with what the others had happened instead of saying, well, the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, so they, you know, that's why they got the atomic bombings. I've had people send me emails like that. So you know, my point of view is yes, we need to talk about them both. They both, all of those are very important, all those stories. I'm only telling the story that I know how to tell and that I can tell, but I think they all need to be out there uh, as long as it's not an either or black and white uh, type of thing. One thing I've noticed is the last time I was at the Peace Museum, um, you know, where they have that diorama, you know, uh, that and then when I was, I think I got the English translation. They made it more of a point to kind of talk about um, the Japanese, you know, military interventions in other Asian countries. So I do think, especially when we're talking about Hiroshima, if it's sincerely supposed to be a city of peace, that all those facets need to be examined. So maybe perhaps like Hiroshima is the best place to do that. Um, but it is a very, uh, one Japanese person told me um, they are very allergic to the issue of like um, the military presence and the atrocities that were done to other Asians. But yeah, so we've got a bunch of questions here. So let me try to, um, I think, uh, okay, so Kathleen, this is a good one for you. What's your sense of the younger generation and their fear or lack thereof about nuclear war or attack? That's from James Toma. Um, well, James, I find that a lot of them, when I start talking about my mother's story or if they read the book, the students will come up to me and they'll say, we didn't know that this is what actually happened when the bomb was dropped. We don't discuss that at all. And so that kind of starts bringing more of the current events in where they're realizing that we all still have nuclear weapons. And 
they realize the damage that can be called from, caused from that. So I feel that they're really starting to pay attention to that. I know that even my daughter's age range, she's 23, um, that there are a lot more people in that age range who are looking at the need for nuclear disarmament and to work towards it. And I think the more that we can talk about it, the more that stories can be out there, like Naomi's and, and mine, I, I think that that will help to really make them understand the danger that's there. And that's why we can't have it happen again. We can't let it happen again. Um, and the more that they can speak up and talk about it, I think the more it gets in front of people who vote and could actually make changes happen. Yeah, Linda, well, Laura Chauvin had oh, Laura. a similar question. Oh yeah, so the, you know, I will read her questions since you know her. Thank you both for sharing your stories. How do you, how do your children or younger people, grandchildren or survivors in your families feel about this part of their heritage, Kathleen? <laughs> Hello, Laura, thank you for coming. Um, actually, you know, with Sarah, she took a very big interest in it. And she asked my mom questions that I didn't have the, the, the uh, I don't know, the courage to ask when I was her age. So she could find out a little bit more about it. And um, Sarah spent a lot of time with my mom. And so she's taken this now to an extra level. She minored in Japanese and she studied in Japan and she took people in her um, group to Hiroshima. And she was like the tour guide there and told my mom's story to them. So I really feel that she wants to continue to get the message out and to keep talking about her, her grandmother's story. And that really, really fills my heart for that. Um, yeah, and Linda said, she, uh, when I was heckled by someone, oh wait, I was heckled by someone while speaking to a large senior citizen group about my mom's memoir, World War II Tokyo Survivor. I spoke about the difference between civilians caught in the middle and a country's military behavior still pertinent. Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah, we, we, we feel you. Um, yeah, definitely. It, it's always good to kind of change, you know, to talk to different kinds of people, <laughs> I would say. Um, Gloria, who's been very involved with CAPS, she says there's been a lot of interest in visuals in trying to get these stories out. Have you experienced such pushback? How long did it take uh, you to, once your, once your book was published, how long did it take, I mean, not published, uh, completed, once your manuscript was completed, how long did it take you to get published? It took over a year when my agent was sending it around, and a lot of times, I think it seemed that they didn't, want, they liked the idea, but they didn't want to touch it because of what it was. And I even had an editor say to me, well, if you can write it starting with the bomb and you make it a story where she kind of like fights her way through it. And she actually uses the wording to me, you know, like Harry Potter. And I'm like, it's not a magic story. It's, it's not a happy, happy ending. You know, so I found that it was really hard to try to be able to get to tell the story uh, to be true and respectful to what actually happened that day. It, it was very difficult. How about you? Did you? Uh... Well, mine only took 15 years. <laughs> well, it was a six year process from writing to getting it done. <laughs> yeah. Well, but also I think, um, well, I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> but it was also my first Muscle Ride book got published in 2004. So I think it's also a tiny issue. I think, um, especially children's literature, I think people are more willing to read and actually um, Cynthia, my friend Cynthia Karahata has written a book about mm -hmm. Hiroshima as well. Yes. So, you know, um, Tim asks, hi Tim, have both of your books been translated in Japanese and released there? If so, the response and reaction to them. I'm still waiting, we're hoping. <laughs> They're looking for the foreign rights and hopefully maybe someone. <laughs> You have, I know not. Yeah, two, and then Hiroshima Boy is going to be um, trans released next year, okay. and hopefully, I mean, who knows with this pandemic? But I would really like to go. With um, Hiroshima was boy, um, the response from Japan was been little different. People were reading it in English, ah. you know, and actually, some people who had ties to the Peace Museum. So I think the fact that it took place in Japan, you know, that might have, yeah. um, I mean, I, I know, you know, contemporary, that could be, you it know, too. 
I'm, yeah. I'm not sure, but, um, but, you know, back to what um, I, uh, I was saying about Hiroshima Boy doesn't have that kind of Korean aspect to it. So maybe they were more open to it too. So who knows? <laughs> um, Kathleen, and two people mentioned Grave of the Fireflies, Peter and Patricia do. Um, I don't know, I, I haven't seen it. Uh, Peter says it's a very powerful piece of animation that was originally made by Studio Ghibli. Mm. That they recommend that you see it, I guess me too, um, especially for your speaking programs. Um, although it isn't about Hiroshima itself, it's about the bombing of Tokyo and two young children. Mm. I have heard about that one. Um, and the one thing though that I wanted to say with the, the books for the translation, there have been a lot of schools in Japan who are the, um, that they speak English at or the American schools, like the Hiroshima uh, school, uh, I forget the name of the whole, the whole thing of that, but they also use my book as well, which is so cool is that they actually do use it in English. So that is one neat thing. Um. Quite a few people asked about Masurai. What it, would he be doing during the pandem pandemic? I think <laughs> he'd be doing fine because he just wants people to leave him alone. <laughs> so, and he, I don't know, would M Moss be one of these people not wearing a mask? Uh -oh. I'm not sure. I don't know. That's it's hard to kind of tell with him. <laughs> you be honest. Um, I don't know if he'd be, I don't know. Um, and then, uh, any update on Moss stories being made into a movie? We attempted to do a, a version of Summer of the Big Bachi and it didn't work out. Look on my blog for the details. But I'm still hopeful that someday there might be something, you know, people love mysteries. Jessica Fletcher is so popular. You know, I think, yeah, people would love to see an old gardener solving crimes. It'd just be a matter of who would be playing with them. Um, Kyoni Young, thank you, Kyoni. Uh, the renowned actor talks about writing dialogue. Are you aware of the Nisei accent? It is a I, Kyoni. I I grew up in you know saturated, marinating with all the that language in my ears. Um, so yes, I love to represent it in my writing. It's not always appreciated. Some people say it's disrespectful, but um, I really love doing it. And um, okay, Linda asks, Kathleen, regarding possible pushback, any publisher comments about the rather graphic descriptions of finding your grandfather considering um, the age range of the intended audience? Oh, interesting. The story uh, gently told into this startling description. Well, we did go back and forth on that a lot and they wanted it to be upper middle grade, like 11 and up because I've had it taught in fifth grade and up and, uh, and not to the younger. It was tough because middle grade, if your character is 12, then it's got to be middle grade and it's not always YA. So I think that was part of it. But my editor was really good at working with me so that I could be true and respectful to what happened, but without being gratuitous. So um, I think we kind of found a balance that we could use for that then. Well, our time is up. We're going to pass the baton um, over to Joy. But thank you so much. You. This was really a great, yeah. It was wonderful for all of you here. It was so great to be with you, Naomi. Thank you. Bye bye. This is thank the you. hug. The uh, hug. <laughs> Whatever. Yeah. I know. <laughs> Zoom needs a Zoom needs a hug reaction. We'll yeah. <laughs> write yeah. into them. Well, but I wanted. <laughs> I wanted to thank you both so much again for um, sharing your stories and such a powerful program today. Um, I also wanted to remind folks that you can please support these authors. Please buy yeah. these books. I think Kathleen said the last few hardcovers are available in the Janum store. So definitely get those now. Um, and I know your paperback is coming out soon as well. So we're all really excited for that. Um, but you can find it at janumstore.com or shop Janum store on Instagram. Um, and as always, just really appreciate your support um, for the museum um, and visit janum.org to find out more about our Janum at Home programs, um, have some other things on the <laughs> burners with Naomi and other really exciting folks. So really excited to um, uh, share that with us, um, share that with all of you, um, as well as if please, um, ah, 
my words, I um, want to encourage you to please um, become a member and support the museum in that way if you enjoyed the program today. Um, and if you also enjoyed it, please uh, follow us and share your reactions on social media and reach out to the authors as well. Um, so once again, thank you so much for um, joining us today. I'm dropping the um, feedback survey in the chat. So please fill that out as well so that we can continue to put on programming like this and make it better and better every time. Um, and with thank that, thank you so much um, to you both. And oh, thank you, Joy. Thanks for all your help with this. Yeah, thank you. Okay.